Khan. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I hope uh, you can see my screen and also hear clearly. Okay. No, everything is fine, sir. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to all of you for joining uh, today. And uh, uh, before me, uh, Professor Ghosh has given you a very lucid uh, overview of what can go wrong and uh, what has been already done wrong with our uh, infrastructure, particularly the buildings. Now, I will try to continue from there and try to give you some idea of what we can do. So, we have made so many mistakes already and we are continuously making those mistakes. We are continuing with those. So, we have a lot of work to do to uh, take care of those uh, mistakes. And let me tell you, some of those mistakes will be uh, taken care of now. But some of those are such that it will be very difficult or very costly to take care of those uh, uh, at a later stage. So the best strategy for seismic risk mitigation is to do earthquake resistant construction now onwards. So let's see that whichever building or structure we are involved, if we are constructing our building, or we are uh, uh, having a jurisdiction over some building which uh, is under construction. So we should take care of all the norms for uh, earthquake resistant construction so that uh, we don't have to worry about that at a later stage, which may be very uh, difficult and uh, costly affair. So I will talk about uh, uh, the uh, main components of risk mitigation. First is uh, assessment of the risk. What is risk? So what constitutes risk? Seismic risk, especially is risk B2 earthquake. Then I will talk about our traditional construction, uh, that is masonry buildings, which we are building in all our uh, cities, small cities, villages. And then I will talk a little bit about RCC buildings also, so multi-story RCC buildings. As you can understand that uh, retrofitting of uh, multi-story RCC buildings will require detailed modeling. So that is a little bit involved, but uh, our common buildings, uh, which we are constructing uh, without much input from uh, engineering side, we, we can do very easy. So I will start with that. So if we have to take care of the seismic risk, what should we know? Uh, what is required? So three questions we have to ask or we have to answer. First is, how strong is our enemy? So in this case, uh, it is the earthquake hazard, which is the enemy against which we have to strengthen our structure. Then what are our weaknesses? So weaknesses are vulnerability of our buildings. So our buildings and infrastructures, how vulnerable they are to a given earthquake or the level of earthquake which we are expecting at that site. And then the third one is that uh, how big is the problem? How many people will be affected? So earthquake hazard, it is uh, label of earthquake or uh, intensity of ground shaking. So this is not in our control. This is a natural phenomenon. So only nature will decide that what type of earthquake uh, is going to come in future. So we cannot control earthquakes. What we can control is that we can reduce the vulnerability of our structures. So we can make our structures safer for a given level of earthquake. And uh, if large number of people are expected to be affected by a particular uh, region uh, due to earthquake or due to vulnerability of the building, then that should be our priority. And uh, as I have shown here, that seismic risk is actually a function of all these three. Hazard, we cannot control. It is natural phenomena, but we can definitely improve vulnerability. We can reduce vulnerability. And exposure is continuously increasing day by day. The people uh, who are uh, coming to the towns, those are increasing. And our big cities are expanding like anything. Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, those are increasing in a tremendous pace. So that exposure is increasing. And that way, the seismic risk is increasing. Now, coming to first earthquake, I want to give you an idea what earthquake is. So this is a typical record of an earthquake, we can think it like a signature of an earthquake. So every earthquake has a unique signature. And uh, what this signature is giving? UG double dot. So this UG double dot is actually acceleration of ground. So what is the acceleration of the ground? So earthquake actually does not apply any force on the structure. It causes the ground below the structure to move suddenly. 
and this movement is in a zigzag fashion. So it is not a smooth movement, it is in jerks. So it is something like this that if you are standing in a bus and the bus suddenly stops or suddenly starts, you feel like that somebody has pushed you forward or backward. So similar type of experience uh, is uh, there with the building or our structure and due to this sudden jerky movement of the ground, the, uh, the structure is subjected to a fictitious force. So we also say that earthquake force is not real. This is the fictitious force, which is due to the property of inertia. So, you know, every body has uh, some inertia and uh, as the ground moves, the structure is subjected to a fictitious force, imaginary force, which is equal to mass into acceleration. So the force acting on the structure is also following the same path, same uh, pattern with time. So you can see that this pattern is uh, changing its direction. So within a fraction of second, the total duration is something like 30 seconds, uh, which is uh, normal duration. And uh, within that duration, it is uh, changing its direction many times. And uh, this gives us some idea that how the earthquake force is changing with time. And uh, we take advantage of this. Uh, let me tell you that earthquake force is very large as compared to our normal forces which we have due to gravity, due to the weight of the structure, which every structure has to support. As compared to that, the earthquake force is very large. And even when we are designing our structures, we never design our structures for the full earthquake force because that will be too uneconomical. It will be too costly if we design our uh, structure for the full earthquake force. So what we do, we design for reduced earthquake force. And when we are designing for reduced earthquake force, our structure will undergo damage. But we make sure that the damage should not be so large that our structure is collapsing. So we accept uh, damage during earthquake, but we do not accept collapse. Because if a structure is collapsing, if a building is collapsing, then um, the chances of life loss or the risk to life will be very large. So we take advantage of this universal nature of uh, earthquake because you can think it like this. The earthquake is applying a force, let us say, towards left. And the structure will deform for some time under that force. And in the meantime, the earthquake will change its direction. Now the earthquake will apply a force towards right. So that way, earthquake, the same earthquake, which is causing damage or which is causing deformation of our structure, will also save our structure. So we take advantage of this action of earthquake. And what we do, we do not design our structures for the full earthquake force. We design for only one tenth of or one twentieth of the earthquake force. In that range, we are designing. We never design for the full earthquake force. So please keep in mind, earthquake force is very large. Sometimes people say that my structure is standing here for uh, 20 years or 50 years and nothing happened. Or maybe uh, Kutub Minar is standing for several hundred years. And uh, that means that these are earthquake safe, earthquake resistant. No, earthquake is a very, very rare phenomenon. So uh, the major earthquake which we are talking about has a return period of 2,500 years. So we are looking for that. And no structure is standing there for such long time. So every structure we have is vulnerable. And even if we design our structure as per code, as per the current practice, we do everything nicely, even then it will undergo damage during earthquake. If the major one, which is having a return period of 2,500 years, if that one comes. And we do not know when that earthquake, when that 2,500 year is at a particular location. So that information is not there. So what we have to do, we have to prepare every instant like the earthquake corresponding to a 2,500 year second period is expected in that moment. And this expected earthquake is given uh, by Bureau of Indian Standards. So some of you may be familiar with this code. So there are uh, two maps here. One is given by BIS, another is given by NDMA. And what we see here, using these maps, we can determine that what level of earthquake is expected at my location. So I can read from these uh, maps. These are called uh, donation maps and the whole country is divided into four zones starting from zone two to zone five. And you can see there is no zone one and there is interesting history behind that. Earlier there used to be a zone zero and zone one in the country. 
and it was assumed that uh, within zone zero there will not be any earthquake. But later it was discovered that earthquakes come in that zone, and there is evidence of earthquakes coming in the past, and that's why zone zero and zone one have been done away, and we are starting with zone two. So zone two, zone three, zone four, and zone five. These are the four zones. Then, as I said, that earthquake is a rare phenomenon. Then, uh, uh, which earthquake we should design for? So, different levels of earthquakes are defined in quotes, and these are defined in terms of the probability of occurrence in 50 years. Why 50 years? Because uh, the usual life of a structure will take us 50 years. So, we have an earthquake which has a 50% probability. 50% means 50 50. That means there is always a chance that such earthquake will occur during the lifespan of every structure. So that we call serviceability earthquake or SE. And it has a return period of uh, approximately 72 years. And then there is a maximum considered earthquake MCE, which has 2% probability of occurrence in 50 years. And keep in mind, it has 2% probability. So that means even larger than this can also come. But in our design, we consider only this much. We assume that the probability of Higher than this is very, very low. And uh, if that comes, then we can't have, we cannot design our structures. It will be too costly. So we design our structures only up to this. 2% probability in 50 years. Then we have to also define uh, the goal, what we want from our structure. As I said, that uh, every structure, even if we design as per code, will be subjected to some damage during it. We never design our structures not to get damaged. But can we expect all our structures to under, undergo severe damage? For example, if a hospital building is damaged after an earthquake to an extent that it is not usable, then there is no point in uh, having such a hospital building. So there we will like the damage to be restricted to an extent that the building should remain usable even after earthquake. And uh, that type of performance we call operation. And how we can ensure this? If I have to keep, I, if I have to make my uh, hospital operational after earthquake, I have to design the structure also, uh, having sufficient strength. So that we call immediate occupancy. And then I have to also ensure that all the uh, services, equipment, the uh, lines like uh, water line, sewer line, oxygen line, vacuum line, all these are op uh, operational. So all my uh, equipment and services and non-structural components, those should also be operational. In our common building, which uh, we design for uh, uh, resi as residences of uh, individual families, there perhaps we don't want that stringent level. And there we have what we call collapse prevention. So in this collapse prevention, the structure will get damaged but it will not damage to an extent that it is collapsed. So it may be at verge of collapse. It may not be usable after uh, the earthquake. There will be some injuries also, but those injuries should not be life-threatening or collapse should not be there because if collapse is occurring, then there will be severe injuries. Uh, people may be trapped and there may be deaths. So that situation we want to avoid in a base structure. Now, what we can do to achieve this? First, I will talk about the most common structures and machinery structures, which uh, maybe many of we are living also. So, uh, in case of masonry, let me first tell you what happens to masonry during earthquake. Although uh, Professor Ghosh has already discussed that, but I want to discuss the uh, physical phenomena. So, you have to understand that masonry walls are uh, very weak in outer plane. So, uh, those uh, walls made of either stone masonry or brick masonry in cement mortar or mud mortar, those have very low tensile strength. And due to that, their outer plane uh, capacity is very small. So during earthquake, earthquake comes in all the direction. <clears throat> so buildings will move like this in outer plane and those will move in in plane also. So those are very weak in outer plane. <clears throat> Sorry. That's why you might have seen uh, in photos or might have experienced that even the boundary walls fall during earthquake. So even boundary walls, which are not supporting any load, which are not supporting any roof, those are not able to withstand earthquake because those are prone to failure in out of plane. How we can prevent this? In in plane, 
if we do not have too many too many openings for windows and doors then in inclined these walls are sufficiently strong so what we have to do we have to have two sets of wall perpendicular to each other so what will happen in for one direction of earthquake one set of the walls will be supporting the other walls and in the other direction of earthquake the other set will be supported so masonry walls or masonry buildings can withstand earthquake only if the orthogonal walls are acting together this we call box action so somehow we have to ensure box action so if we ensure box box action for masonry buildings then the chances of surviving earthquake increase then another problem is the number of openings if we have too many openings for example if you see this building a uh, multi story three story building which is shown here and you have these diagonal cracks these diagonal cracks show that the material which was left to resist earthquake force is reduced too much because there are many openings here and due to those openings the remaining solid portion which will be actually uh, resisting the earthquake so most critical location in our building is here between the uh, openings for windows so this portion has got damaged and that is indicating that the openings are too many or the open or the remaining uh, remaining length of the wall solid uh, wall length is not adequate to resist that <laughs> integral box section there are some uh, specific problems those specific problem is uh, in case of sloping roof what happens in case of sloping roof we have uh, uh, what we call uh, gable end this gable end is uh, a cantilever triangular portion of the wall and this portion is very weak because this does not have any perpendicular walls to support it and you can see in this photo all the gables have fallen and the fourth issue in case of masonry walls is which is specific to random rubble masonry wall so in random rubble masonry walls we make two bits these two curtains of walls on two sides and in between we fill up some material so that may be either uh, mortar cement or mud or small stone when this is subjected to shaking you can understand what will happen this will split sorry something happened so uh, what will happen and, and mr anup you you are not supposed to uh, share the screen please uh, remove your sharing so can you see my screen no not yet not not yet uh, please remove somebody anup anup gas yeah stop sharing please yeah and um, now sing sahab you have to redo it okay all right come come in okay i will make it full screen slide okay i think now it's okay so one specific problem to these uh, random rubble masonry walls which are uh, quite sing sahab just one minute all all yeah. the parts just one minute sir all the participants are requested not to please uh, disturb the flow of the presentation disturb the flow so please 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 be extra cautious thank you things are your turn okay so uh, this is a specific problem of uh, random rubble masonry so this random rubble masonry wall these split during earthquake and these walls are quite common even in uh, Uh, parts of Maharashtra and uh, Madhya Pradesh, as well as our uh, whole of our Himalayan and hilly regions. So there, stones are readily available, and the problem is that these walls split during earthquake. And when these walls split, their thickness reduces to let us say half. Their moment of inertia will reduce to one eighth. Uh, you know that moment of inertia is proportional to the cube of the thickness. So uh, this moment of inertia reduces, and then the wall will. fall in out of plane action so we have to take care of uh, these issues and these are suggested in the code first of all the first issue how i can make my uh, building as an integral box so if when you are constructing a new building the code uh, 
4326 provides the measures that you have to provide a continuous lintel band. So a continuous lintel band is to be provided here, which will keep these four walls together. And wherever we expect tension in our uh, wall, we have to provide reinforcement, vertical reinforcement here. So at the jams of openings, what are jams of openings? The vertical faces of openings of door and window. So there we have to provide vertical reinforcement. So in case of a new building, that reinforcement can be provided inside the building itself. So if you are making a new building, please make sure that this band, this lintel which we provide here, this is continuous all around. But in case of an existing building, what we can do? In existing building, the wall is already constructed, so we, not, we cannot insert that. What we can do is we can provide wire mesh from outside. So the same reinforcement we will provide in the form of wire mesh and we will cover it with plaster. I will also show you an example of how we have done it. So this wire mesh is to be provided at the lintel level all around, then it is to be provided along the jams. And where if there is an intermediate wall, a junction here, then it, is, it needs to be provided at junction also. And from inside as well as outside. And then it is to be connected these uh, two faces or uh, the wire mesh provided at the two faces of the wall need to be interconnected through these nails or wire. So we drill a hole into the wall and then connect it through a wire so that this is not separating from the wall during earthquake. So this will take care of the integral box section. There are other possibilities also to take care of the integral box section. And uh, that is by providing two rods like this and pre-stressing these. So somehow we have to ensure that the four walls should act together. That is our first act. And you can do many things, uh, many ways. Two solutions I have shown here, but there is a possibility of other solutions also. You can think of those. The other issue we thought was, we discussed was that there is, uh, there has to be integrity at corners. So where the corners are there, you can see that these uh, splints, these vertical members we call splints and the horizontal members we call bandage or bag. So these splints, vertical bands, these should be provided covering the corner, both outside as well as inside of the wall. Similarly, the junction of the wall with another wall here, which is a T junction, there also it needs to be provided outside as well as inside. And if the openings are very large or too many openings, then some of the openings we have to close. The thumb rule is, more details I will show you, the more details are available in IS 13935, 2009. So this code was revised in 2009, 13935. So there it is given that how much opening you can allow in a particular building. But thumb rule, you can take it like this, that in case of a single story building, the length of the opening should not be more than half of the length of any wall. For example, in this building, the length of opening will be this dimension and this dimension. It should not be more than half of this. But the previous building you have seen here, too much openings. So the more than half length is, and in case of multi-story buildings, this length should not be more than one third. So in this building, the length of the opening should have been only one third. So at least two third length of the wall should be solid because this solid wall only will resist earthquake. So this should be solid. If there are too many openings, we have to close some of the walls. Then in case of random double masonry, what we can do so that our wall does not split. If we are constructing a new building, then what we do in random double masonry, we provide longer stones. So you might have seen when we are constructing uh, uh, buildings in brick masonry, then some of the bricks we provide along the wall and some of the bricks we provide across the wall. And the role of these bricks which we are providing across the wall is that it keep the full thickness of the wall as interior. It integrates the full thickness of the wall. But if the building in rubber masonry has been already constructed and where these long stones have not been provided, what we can do, we can replace that by this RCC member. And we provide, we first make a hole, then we put this uh, uh, bar which is bent in this fashion, and then we fill it up with concrete or cement mortar. Then this will act like a long stone and it will keep this uh, wall integral and it will not allow this to uh, stick during earthquake.
then i talked about this is 139025 the question you can ask me here is that how much wire mesh i should put so that is needed so this is given in is 139035 uh, it is pre calculated for different zones so it divides buildings into different categories and these categories are based on the zone so normal buildings will be zone 2 3 4 and 5 in case of important buildings you can shift it once so even zone 4 important buildings will come under category e and then what this table gives you depending on the length of the wall length of the wall means the length between two perpendicular walls so not the full wall length length from here from this wall to this wall then how many wires are to be provided what size these wires are there and how much is this width of this belt this strip uh, this uh, strip and uh, this uh, bandage that is given here so for a length of the wall you can read from here the gauge so here it is gauge 10 wire we have to take and uh, please note that this wire mesh has to be galvanized because any steel you put is prone to corrosion wherever you put iron it will be subjected to corrosion in future jang lagega and due to that it will split it will get damaged so to avoid that we should always use galvanized wire mesh so galvanized wire mesh of gauge 10 and the minimum 10 number of wires should be there and then the total width will be 280 so on a width of 280 we should provide 10 wires and from here you can estimate that what should be the spacing what should be the grid size you you can calculate from here and you will cut a strip of that wire mesh and provide here so that will take care of that integral action similarly in vertical direction also same uh, way we need to know the reinforcement the number of wires the width of this vertical belt so that is also given in the same code is 1393 uh, 5 and uh, please note all these codes are now available free anybody can download these from uh, uh, bureau of indian standards bis website so you can download and these codes at least this particular code which i am talking even a person who is not having background in civil engineering can understand so just download these codes even if you are constructing your building it is good to download these codes and just go through once it will give you a lot of idea that how the building should be constructed retrofitted and if you are uh, constructing a new building then there is a similar code is 4326 so you may not down and uh, we will also write in the response so you uh, get is 4326 and 1395 these are mostly non engineered construction code so they do not require any engineering background if you can uh, read english and you can understand that easily you can implement so i am giving you an example here in the uh, vertical direction in zone 2 there is no need of vertical reinforcement in zone 3 if it is a three story building then we need to provide vertical reinforcement in zone 4 and 5 we have to provide this reinforcement and uh, how many uh, wires you require okay what gauge and what is the uh, what, what is the width of this splint that is given in this table so you you can read uh, from here okay then there are other uh, situations also uh, which need specific solutions for example if you have a uh, ward or a barrack like structure what happens in a hospital ward uh, there are many old hospitals in our country which are made in masonry uh, and the length of these buildings is very large so these barrack type structures are very large length very long walls and these long walls you can see from this table these are prone to failure and even the code gives only up to 8 meter so if the wall is up to 8 meter you can retrofit like this but if the wall is more than 8 meter then what you can do you have to support the wall in outer plane so you have to provide a uh, cross wall here which will support so that's why i said that the length of the wall is between two perpendicular wall between two cross wall not the full length so this length should not be more than 8 meter in case this is more than 8 meter then you should provide a cross wall here 
alternative to this, if it is not possible to provide cross wall, then we can provide buttresses. Buttresses have the same purpose as the cross wall to support this wall in out of plane action, but these can be provided from outside. So these are not hindering the usage. So somehow we have to provide support to these walls in out of plane action. And uh, the length of the unsupported wall should not be more than eight meters as per this code. Alternative to this uh, wire mesh in vertical direction, we can also provide a steel rod like this. A single steel rod can also be provided. And in the same table, you will see a single bar diameter is also given that if you are providing a single bar, then what should be the diameter of that single bar? If you are providing wire mesh, then how many wires should be there and what should be the spacing? Both the alternatives are given in the code. So we can use this or we can use the wire mesh. Then there is another specific problem which is related to arch or uh, arch roof. So both possibilities are there in case of old buildings when uh, reinforcement was not there, the Sariya was not invented. Uh, in those buildings, historical buildings, arches are used. These are very beautiful and uh, work very well under gravity load. Problem happens that during earthquake, their springings, these start moving. And if those are moving together, there is not much problem. But if these start moving out of phase, if these start moving away from each other, then the arch will collapse. So we have to avoid the differential movement of these walls, the springings at the base. And how, how we can do that? We can do that either by providing these tie rods. So simply uh, drilling hole and grouting these uh, rods at the springing of the arches, we can make sure that the two ends of the arch are moving together. And Alternatively, we can provide a lintel here. So we can insert a lintel and this top portion we may or may not fill. Okay, but this may affect the architecture. This may not be uh, acceptable from the aesthetic beauty of uh, the structure. But at least this much we can do. Please keep in mind, there is no way by which without touching the structure, we can make it up to this. Some intervention has to be done. If we have made a mistake in the past, we have to compromise in some way now and we have to do some intervention we have to do some modification to the structure then only we can make it safe for us then there are other uh, methods of uh, strengthening uh, a number of uh, materials people have tried and one such material is uh, different types of fibers so you may be knowing that there are glass fibers there are uh, uh, carbon fibers and there are also some natural fibers like basalt fiber so, which have natural origin and uh, some uh, uh, fibers have their origin uh, from uh, plants. For example, we, we may have jute fiber. So, those can also be used to strengthen the wall. So, strengthening can be done at the same location which we discussed in the form of a splint and bandage or we can strengthen the whole wall like we have shown here. So, if we strengthen the whole wall, then it will help not only in outer plane, this will also help in in plane. So, these are slightly more involved methods which require uh, some testing and some calculations for design. So, if somebody is interested in uh, pursuing this, then they can see there is, there is a lot of literature I have given here, uh, which type of fibers they have used. And coming to RCC buildings. So RCC buildings, uh, first of all, some people think that RCC buildings are better than assembly buildings. Those are stronger than the assembly. That is not true. That may not be always true. If the RCC buildings are not properly constructed, then those will be worse than masonry buildings. So if you are constructing a building up to three stories, then masonry is a good material. You can very well, uh, construct earthquake resistant buildings using masonry. If you are doing RCC, if you want to use frame, if you want to uh, construct RCC building, then please be careful. It requires better understanding of a structure and engineering input. Our uh, contractors and masons are not uh, well versed with these types. 
even our engineers, many of our, our engineers, as uh, Professor Ghosh was talking, that so called engineered buildings which we are constructing, multi story buildings, those are also uh, vulnerable uh, because the provisions of good constructions are not followed. And there are many failures. I will not, uh, my purpose is not to give you all the failures, but I just want to give you what usually goes wrong with masonry, sorry, with frame buildings. So, very common problem with uh, RCC frame buildings is when we keep this down the story open. And uh, during Bhuj earthquake, so many buildings in uh, Ahmedabad, which is far away from Bhuj, more than 300 kilometers. Actually, at 300 kilometers, nothing should have happened to our buildings. But many such buildings, not one, so many buildings fell where the ground story uh, collapsed. Now, I will tell you the basis. I will tell you the principle, what happened here. So, I told you that even when we are designing our buildings, those are prone to damage. What we want? We want that the damage should be well distributed in our building. If the damage is not well distributed, it will be concentrated at a location. It will collapse. The building will collapse under a smaller earthquake. If the damage is well distributed, then the building can sustain larger earthquake because then it will be able to dissipate the energy in the larger volume. So we want that the damage should be distributed. How we can make sure that the damage is distributed? Then there should not be a weak link. We should not have any weak link in our uh, building. All the stories should have more or less same type of construction. So what happens here, in the upper stories, we provide masonry infills. We provide partitions. And these masonry infills increase the strength and stiffness of the building several times. The strength is increased up to three times. And stiffness is increased more than 20 times also. So due to that, this ground story becomes weak link. And if this type of weak link exists, naturally the damage will be concentrated. And as you can see here, in the upper story, there is hardly any damage except this masonry, which was uh, failing. Uh, I should tell you that before earthquake, both these blocks were identical. This block was also like this. But here you see the ground story has totally gone. So due to the falling, due to the impact, this masonry has failed. But nothing happened in the upper story because the upper story is very strong. So we have to avoid this type of weak link. That, that is the first thing in our building. Then sometimes these walls are partially uh, closed. So we have partial height walls. These partial height walls are even more dangerous. Why? Because this small length of the column, which is left here, we call it a short column. And the short column is subjected to very large shear force, and we get this type of diagonal failure. And this type of diagonal failure is further uh, aggravated because of these lateral tiles. So if you have seen construction uh, of columns, you know, or beams, there is uh, vertical reinforcement and there are, uh, there are horizontal hoops. Usually we ignore the importance of these hoops. We don't understand that, uh, what is the role of these hoops. Let me tell you, these lateral hoop, this transverse reinforcement is even more important than the longitudinal reinforcement. Even if you compromise with the longitudinal reinforcement, it will not make that big a harm which will be made by these stirrups. And what should we do uh, for these stirrups? First of all, these stirrups should be close enough. These should not be very far. And in the portion, in the region of the column near the joint, the spacing should not be more than 100 millimeter. So this 100 millimeter, you can take another uh, thumb rule that the stirrups, this transverse reinforcement which we are providing, the spacing should not be more than 100 millimeter in the portion near the joint. That means at the top and at the bottom. And you can see here clearly the spacing is more. And then here, although the infill was not there, but you see here, it has failed again. And the reason is that the stirrups were too thin and those were far away. So these stirrups are the most common mistake. Lack of these stirrups, improper stirrups, and these stirrups should be anchored into the longitudinal reinforcement with an angle of 135 degrees. So those, these should be properly anchored. These should not open during earthquake. So if these open or these fail during earthquake, the RCC members are prone to failure. So we have to ensure that these 
should be adequate when we are constructing a new structure. Then another problem is that these masonry infills which we provide, uh, even when we are designing our buildings, we do not take these infills into account. And as a result, what happens? These infills are applying a force on the column. These are pushing the column and beam during earthquake. And you can see here, the column has failed. Why this column has failed? Because these infills were applying a protection. Senior था, मैं में था, वो पास था। Can you mute? So I, I will finish. I, I will finish. So these uh, infills apply a lateral force, and uh, these uh, lateral force causes shear failure of uh, these uh, columns. So in a new building, we can avoid this by providing uh, adequate uh, number and spacing of uh, stirrups. But what we can do in a new building? I will just give you the glimpses. So this retrofitting of RCC building requires a better understanding and it requires engineering calculation. So for retrofitting of RCC building, involvement of an engineer is required because some calculations will be required. But I will give you an idea what even a common man can do. First of all, uh, we have to increase the strength of the ground story if it is open. Because if it was open, it, the uh, damage will get concentrated here. What we can do, we can provide RCC wall. And advantage of providing RCC walls is that few walls will take care of the uh, lack of strength in the ground story. So strength after providing these few RCC walls will be comparable with the upper story. So somehow we have to make the strength and the stiffness of the ground story comparable with the upper story. And at the same time, some opening should be there so that the ground story can continue to function as parking because parking is also a problem. Alternatively, we can provide these braces, steel braces. The purpose of these steel braces is also same. Okay. In case of hilly areas, there is a specific problem on the downhill side. We have uh, uh, Professor Ghosh has also shown several buildings where on the those were standing on a stilts. These columns were open. So if these columns were open, there is no infill here, then this will be subjected to damage. So we have to close this also with uh, RCC wall. Usually we ignore this because we don't use this portion. So we think that this portion is not, uh, there is, uh, it is not uh, wise to put money here, but whole of our building is standing on this. So this portion also cannot be neglected. Otherwise during earthquake, the building will collapse. Then uh, there are some more sophisticated methods in this building. The shear walls have been constructed around the building. Here, the, a frame uh, consisting of uh, large size columns and beams has been provided all around. So we have encased the building in shear wall or uh, frame in such a way that this frame will take care of the lateral force. Then uh, sometimes it is possible to provide braces if uh, this building was having this projected column. So we can provide these braces also. And these braces are to be designed. These are not to be provided by thumb rule. So these needs to be calculated and designed. Then we can provide RCC jacketing. We can increase if uh, we are not provided adequate strength in the original uh, structure. We can jacket it using RCC. We can also jacket using uh, FRP. So what you see here, this is uh, jacketing using FRP. FRP is fiber reinforced polymer. So using this fiber reinforced polymer, it is it is like banded. Uh, we, we provide all around the column. And this fiber has very high strength. It is uh, much stronger than steel. And uh, it is glued to the building. The other advantage is that it can be glued around uh, the columns or the beams. Two very interesting techniques which we use, which I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, one issue is, uh, I mean, I discussed the earthquake that it applies force. We can also think earthquake as energy. So whatever energy the earthquake is giving to my structure, the structure should be able to dissipate that energy. Dissipation of the energy, you understand uh, that energy cannot be destroyed but it has to be converted into another form of energy. And what is that another form? Heat. So my structure has to dissipate all the energy which is coming to the structure in the form of heat. And how the structure can do that? 
the structure can do that by damage. That's why I told you that it is uh, inevitable to have damage during earthquake because when the structure will get damaged, there will be friction, there will be cracking, and the structure will be able to dissipate energy through those cracks. So damage is inevitable. How we can reduce that damage in two ways. If I help my structure to uh, dissipate that energy, then the structure will require less damage to dissipate the remaining energy. Alternatively, what I can do, I can reduce the flow of energy into my structure. How I can reduce the flow of energy into the structure? By detuning. Like the radio set, if you tune with the station, the signal will flow. If you change the frequency, then the energy will, signal will not flow. So same thing we do here. We change the frequency of vibration or period of vibration of our structure by providing flexible elements below. These flexible elements are similar to the neoprene bearings you have seen in bridges. So we provide bearings below the bridges and purpose there is to allow the thermal movement during summer and winter when the length of the bridge is changing, it should be able to move. Something similar we provide here, these flexible elements. And what happens when we provide these flexible elements? Then the frequency of structure will be different than the frequency of the ground during earthquake. And the energy will not flow or less energy will flow. And if less energy is flowing, then the uh, damage in the structure will less because the structure has to dissipate less energy. And this can be done in new buildings. This can be done in case of existing buildings also. And here you see in University of California, Berkeley, what they did, they have demonstrated this for an existing building. The whole building they have supported on these props. The soil has been removed. Then below this, these bearings will be provided and a rigid raft will be constructed below the building. So this building will be floating on these bearings. And uh, as a result, when the ground move, that movement will not be transferred to the building. And then the inertia force which will be acting on the building will be reduced. The other alternative is that we help the buildings to dissipate energy. And how we can help the buildings dissipating energy? Through dampers. These dampers are similar to the shock absorbers we are having in our uh, vehicles. So like the shock absorber of a scooter or motorcycle or a car, you are seeing same type of shock absorbers we provide here. So these yellow colored elements, which you see here, these are shock absorbers. These are provided like this, different arrangements. These can be provided. And what happens during earthquake when this building moves, these shockers also move. And when these shockers are moving, these dampers are moving, these are dissipating energy. And when these dissipators, these dampers are dissipating energy, then the structure has been left with less energy to dissipate. And when it has less energy to dissipate, it will be undergoing less damage to dissipate the energy. So these are the principles which we use. But as you can see that in case of uh, RCC buildings, it requires calculations. Quickly, I will just rush through two case studies. Uh, One is since up, uh, we have to slightly move fast because we have already- have Only two minutes. Yes, more okay, than okay. okay. thank you. So here, this was the plan of the building. What we did, first we evaluated uh, the material strength. We made a computer model because I told you that in case of uh, RCC buildings, uh, computer uh, modeling and analysis is required. And then we provided the shear work. And we estimated the performance of these buildings before and after retrofitting. So details are here. You can see in my uh, presentations. And uh, these uh, uh, performance of these buildings before and after earthquake was estimated using uh, this analysis in the form of this capacity curve. And it can show that how much is the enhancement in the capacity of the structure. Then we, I will also show you a masonry building. This is a uh, inter college in uh, Uttarakhand. So this was a typical uh, building which we have taken. We modeled, we did analysis of this. Then we provided this splint and bandage. You can see here the wire mesh is provided. So for that, what we do, we first cut the plaster along uh, these splint and bandage. Remove the plaster, put the wire mesh, and then cover it with the new plaster. And uh, we can either do the plaster in the conventional way, or we can also do what we call short treating. In short treating, we spray the concrete. And finally, the building will look like this. And uh, we compared the performance of this building also. This curve, the lower curve is showing the performance of the building without before retrofitting, and this is showing after retrofitting. You can see 
by providing these splints and bandage, how much increase in the strength of the building can be there. Okay, uh, conclusions I need not to reiterate. So I will stop here. Thank you.